Jacqueline, during the break, I was talking about how lucky we are to have you here to talk about what is going on in Haiti. Can you get us quickly up to speed so people can understand how this just didn't erupt overnight? No, it, it did not. You know, ever since the 2010 earthquake, which left over 300,000 people dead, this has been a country in a downward spiral. We've watched the rise of gangs. We've watched the departure of a United Nations peacekeeping force. We've watched elections um, that have been highly controversial. And twice we have seen where a president was in power and then we had to fall into a transition because you couldn't make that move. So today, you know, we had a president who was assassinated in 2010, mm -hmm. July 7th. Five weeks later, we had a major earthquake again. But then we also fell into a political vacuum with a constitutional crisis because President Jovenel Moise, during his four years in office, he had never had an election. When he was killed in the middle of the night, he was one of 11 elected officials him and 10 senators. Those 10 senators left. And today you have a country that its constitution cannot be applied. So what we saw this week was the international community, the Caribbean leaders with the United States. Secretary of State Blinken personally stopped everything he was doing, flew to Jamaica and with Haitians on a Zoom call because they can't get out of the country because there hasn't been any major carriers flying there as a result of the unrest, basically said, OK, we need to put together some sort of a deal that you guys couldn't do when uh, Moise was in power, and you didn't do when Ariel Henry was there, but we need to figure out what this transition is going to look like. And today, we're waiting for the names of the nine individuals who are going to make up some presidential council, and then they have to get a prime minister, and then they have to prepare the country for a multinational security support mission from Kenya, if it comes and then eventually take Haiti to elections. But in the meantime, you've got over 360,000 people who have been forced from their homes by gangs. We have ongoing gang violence. After a couple of days of quietness, it's restarted. And you have a police force that is overworked, outgunned. I mean, that is unbelievably sobering. And I started your interview by talking about hundreds of Americans trying to get yes. out. Let's talk about Haitians that are trying to get out. On Thursday, the U.S. Coast Guard stopped 65 Haitians who were trying to flee to Haiti by boat, sent them back to Haiti. Yeah. Uh, Jacqueline, what, what a lot of people don't know is, and this is familiar to us because we're in Miami, this is two hours away from yes. Miami. There's a wet foot, dry foot policy that used to apply where Cubans could flee the island of Cuba to come to the United States to seek asylum here, and they could be taken on, on by our country yes. if they actually got one foot on dry land. That's why the wet foot, dry foot. But what I want people to understand is Haitians never had the benefit of this. If Haitians made it to Florida, you know, shorelines, for example, they were turned away immediately, even yes. though they were also fleeing political unrest, political violence. Why are they still being turned away if they're fleeing? a country that is in such a state of chaos. Because most Haitians don't know when they get stopped by the Coast Guard, they actually have to say that I have a fear of being returned. And only then will the Coast Guard then put them into some sort of a second interview to acknowledge or see if there is a credible fear. So what we see is that people are leaving. And, you know, there's been a lot of focus on migration. And let me explain to you. Right now, Port-au-Prince is controlled even more than 80 percent wow. by gangs. And it's landlocked. The gangs control all of the roads um, out of the capital. But should they decide that they're going to open those roads, then we have to be concerned because you may then see people trying to get to the coastal areas in order to get on boats. Yeah. These individuals that we've seen that were picked up, these were people who left the northern part of Haiti. So today you have the Turks and Caicos, you have the Bahamas, you have Jamaica. They're all very concerned that you will start to see people get in boats because of the squeeze. If the seaport is shut down, if the airport is shut down, and this is a country that depends 50 percent of imports, food is not getting in. Potable water is a luxury. Every day that we're in this crisis, every day that we're pushing this humanitarian crisis, and you may see people decide that they're going to leave. And let me just add, the Dominican Republic has said they are not going to turn their country into refugee camps for Haitians. We're being told that they're not even allowing anyone with a Haitian passport to get on any of these helicopters that are charging extraordinary amount of money for people to leave. And so if we're continuing to see deportations from the DR, people will say, you know, what, I'm not going back there if this place is going to be overrun by gangs. So let me take my chance at sea. And we know that is a very dangerous journey.